Hi guys, thank you guys so much for being here today. Today I want to talk about having a craft room all your own and I'm going to give you a little tour of my attic here. Hi there, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm Felicia from Sweet Georgia Yarns and this is Taking Back Friday. So this is a very simple, very tiny little vlog that I record for Fridays every week and I talk about crafting and making things and knitting and color and dyeing and all the things that we do at Sweet Georgia and all the things that I'm making in my personal life and things like that. If you guys have been following for a while, thank you so much for coming back. And if this is your first time here, welcome. I hope that you guys enjoy this content about making things and finding time to make things. If you like content like this, I hope that you will subscribe so that you can get notified about future videos that go up every Friday. So this week, this week I want to talk to you guys about this attic, about this craft room space. This has been something that's been on my list for a couple of months now to share with you guys and I did have a request for it a couple months ago as well about seeing sort of more of the attic than just what you're seeing right now. And so I'm going to turn the camera around and I'm going to show you guys a little bit more about this attic and the craft room that it encompasses. But I want to tell you a little bit about the space and about sort of the story of how we came to get this space. So it is almost five years that we have been living in this house here. About five years ago, we were pregnant with our first baby, which is Russell, and uh, he's four and a half now. He'll be five in November. But during that sort of spring and summer before he was born, we were still living in a very small townhouse in Vancouver. And it was close to city center in Vancouver and it was a wonderful, wonderful location. It was close to Granville Island. We could walk to Granville Island. We could walk along a seawall. It was just fantastic. Close to restaurants, everything was there. Everything except space. The, 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 the size of the squared footage that we lived in was very, very tiny. It was cramped and I had a lot of yarn and a lot of my stuff and just I have a lot of stuff. <laughs> and so trying to mash all this stuff into this tiny little apartment. Well, it's not really an apartment. It was a townhouse, but it was a very tiny townhouse. It was, it was very challenging. And so we recognized that we needed to find a new space to move out from that space and get more space. I know that when I had first uh, purchased that townhouse, the people who were moving out had a small baby and they had one on the way and they had put their baby in sort of like this alcove under a skylight in the corner of the bedroom. And so it wasn't a ton of space. And I just kept thinking, you know, that that's not really feasible for us to have our baby and put it there. So we really, really needed to move that. And also that the space that we were at had only single pane windows. And so it was freezing cold. It was just freezing cold all the time. So in the wintertime, it was always cold. And in the summertime, it was always too hot. And so there was, there was just a lot of that kind of situation. So in any case, we had to move. And so my husband was a little bit more relaxed about the home buying experience. He was very much like, oh, you know, we'll just look around and if we find something, we'll find something. And you know, if the baby comes in November and we still haven't found anything, that's fine. We'll just keep looking after the baby is born. But I was like, no, <laughs> that's not a good idea at all because I can't imagine having to cart around a newborn and trying to go to open houses and trying to figure out if this is the right place for us. Just, I wanted all of that to be settled before we had the baby. And I think it was also partly you know, a lot of like that nesting sort of instinct, a lot of the nesting feeling that you have when you're pregnant, when you're just about to have the baby, you're like, got to get this sorted out. And so we decided to move to um, Richmond, which is just outside of Vancouver. And because uh, my husband's actually originally from Richmond and his family still lives in Richmond. And so it was close to to grandparents and all these kinds of things. So we decided to, to move to Richmond. And so when I started looking at listings, you know, we went to ones that were in our price range and all these kinds of things and things that seemed reasonable. But then there was one that was kind of out of our price range, but I was like, oh, you know, well, why don't we just go see, just go and take a look, you know? And we went to the open house and well, <laughs> I just immediately, fell in love with the space. I just walked in and I felt warm and and it felt open and it felt filled with light and I just immediately fell 
in love with the space. But we already knew that it was totally out of our price range and it was impossible for us to get. So it was just kind of like a pipe dream. It's like, oh, that's really nice, but we'll have to keep looking. But then when we started to come again on other further rounds of, you know, open houses, we came back to the space to take a look again. Just like, hey, we'll just we'll just take a look. And then we thought, well, okay, well, it it looks good. I love it. It feels good. It feels like exactly what I envision something to be. It was exactly what I had in my mind, in my vision of what I wanted for a space. And so I just, I couldn't let go of the feeling. And then we thought, well, why don't we just put in an offer? And uh, everything seemed to be going well and everything seemed to be fine. And we were moving ahead with the process. And then at the very, very, very last minute before things were going to get solidified, uh, we kind of got blindsided and somebody else made an offer that was significantly higher than ours and we lost our opportunity. And so I was devastated. I was devastated. Just like the things had been moving along. We were moving towards this thing that was going to become our dream house and dream space. And then all of a sudden, the floor sort of dropped out from underneath us and that opportunity was gone. And so this happened maybe two days before we were supposed to go on a road trip to Utah. So my husband and I, we had made plans already to go to this event in Utah, which was like a podcasters event, uh, well, hosted by podcasters. And it was called Nerdtacular. And it's all super nerdy. It was all for people, you know, who play World of Warcraft, people who play board games, people who play video games, people who do a lot of podcasting. So in any case, we were meant to go on this road trip, which was 17 hours driving from Vancouver to Salt Lake City to actually the Snowbird Resort in Salt Lake and 17 hours back. So this whole time I was thinking 17 hours of road trip and I'm going to be quite sad and sort of disappointed and upset about having lost this opportunity to have this beautiful house. And so we did. We drove all the way to Snowbird and we did end up having a fantastic, wonderful time and, you know, just try to really remain open to whatever was going to happen. And I think I remember my father-in-law saying that if the house is meant for you, it will come back to you. Like if it's meant for you, if it's meant for your destiny to have this place, it will somehow come back to you. And I was like, well, that's not really comforting because the place is already gone. But in any case, we just went on the trip, um, met tons of podcasters, um, met a couple of people that I have personally admired for a long, long time, one of them being Mark Spagnolo, uh, who does The Wood Whisperer. And so he has an amazing website where they teach woodworking and just woodworking videos and woodworking podcasts and woodworking just everything. And his wife, Nicole, and also um, met a couple of other people who were from sort of the Frog Pants Network who were just very inspiring and very um, entertaining in that whole podcasting, entertainment, gaming sort of world. So that was very positive. And when we came back, we just sort of continued on with our life for a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden, we heard back from our realtor that the original person who put in the offer for this house, their deal fell through. And so they wanted to come back to us and see if we wanted to go ahead and try again. And so we said, yeah. So we again put in our offer at, you know, whatever was in our budget, whatever we could afford and just to see what would happen. After a lot of back and forth and some negotiating, we ended up getting this house. Now you guys might think that this is like unbelievably lucky that we were able to get this house. And I absolutely concur. I think that we are incredibly fortunate and I'm so grateful to be able to have this space to work in. I just feel incredibly blessed and very, very lucky for all of this space. But this is something that's actually been on my mind for years now. And so having this space didn't just spontaneously appear overnight one day. This is something I feel like has been in my mind for years and years and years and years. And only five years ago when we got this house, did it all kind of come together. So last week, at the end of last week's video, I was talking about JC Boggs and her new book, The 51 Yarns to Cast, The 51 Yarns to Spin Before You Cast Off. And then I started looking at my bookshelf and looking at other books that had inspired me significantly in the past 10 or 15 years. 
This book has inspired me a ton. And so this is a book called The Spinning, Weaving, and Dying Book by Rachel Brown. This is the second edition one. And this one is published in 1978. So it's almost as old as I am. No, it's older than I am. <laughs> and then uh, and then it was reprinted in 1983. So I have the 1983 edition. So this is like, it's kind of a an old book. But there's, uh, you know... So there's obviously a lot of very fundamental information in here about weaving, about spinning yarn, about dyeing your own yarn with natural dyes, with other kinds of dyes and things like that. But this book, I spent inordinate amounts of time obsessed with just one page of this book. I don't know if you can see it. Let me see. I hope you guys can see that. That is basically a floor plan for an ideal dream craft room studio space where you have a countermarsh loom that is 45 inches wide and a counterbalance loom that is 60 inches wide and a jack loom that's 45 inches wide and a vertical warping mill and a pressing table and a laundry sink and a washer and a sewing machine. And I obsessed over these few pages for such a long time. And it's all about this idea about how do you find, how do you create your own dream craft space and your own dream place to work? There is a very, very short paragraph here about suggested equipment for the nomadic weaver. So, you know, if you don't have any space to work and you, you have very, very limited resources, you know, where can you work? Where can you find space to work? And what kind of equipment should you use? And you know, it might be hand spindles or it might be like a backstrap loom. Those are the kinds of things that she is suggesting. And then the recommended minimum studio equipment. You know, everybody knows that weaving and spinning, it requires kind of an investment in equipment and tools and materials. It's not as simple as, you know, one crochet hook or a couple of pairs of knitting needles. It requires a little bit more investment. So this paragraph is all about the minimum amount that you might need in order to get started with some weaving and some spinning. So you need a spinning wheel. You need to have a lazy cate for plying. You need to have some bobbins. Maybe you need to have a bobbin winder, all those kinds of things for spinning. And then for weaving, maybe you have to have, you know, different kinds of looms or a very, very simple loom, maybe a rigid head loom. You also need some shuttles. You also need some lee sticks. You also need a couple of other just bits and bobs and accessories and things like that. So what is the minimum amount of stuff that you might need to get started with a craft room or a weaving room or spinning dyeing room? And so I don't know, I became obsessed with these pages, the fully equipped studio, and it lists, you know, three different kinds of looms to have a space for reeds, to have a space for um, different equipment, different tools, different shuttles, different bobbins, everything. Yeah. And so then I have this notebook from a long time ago. This is from 2007, 2007. So this notebook is all wet. It's been totally water damaged. And uh, this notebook is from 2007, 11 years ago. And in here I have In here I have sort of an inordinate amount of weaving plans and sketches and ideas of different things that I was going to weave and make for display and for wearing all sorts of things in this notebook. But here, but here on these pages of this notebook, May 18th, 2008, I sketched out the floor plan of what I wanted Sweet Georgia or what I wanted my craft room or my making space to be like. And you know that it offered space for people to come and to buy yarns, the space for sinks, space for heating things, work table, kitchen, where the winding stations were gonna be, where the offices were gonna be, where the sewing room was gonna be, where the cutting room was gonna be. All of this stuff was sketched out back in 2008. 
And I feel like it's taken that long, that's 10 years ago, almost exactly 10 years ago, for all of this to kind of come together and be what it is now. I feel really great about all the spaces that we work in now. We're almost pretty great, like 90% great. But it's taken that long for all of this to come together. So I don't ever want to take it for granted that if you want a craft room that you can just have one just like that. This is a small incremental process towards getting a space to work in. I think it's actually very dreamy and very oh, luxurious <laughs> to have room, to have natural light, to have all of these kinds of things, because it wasn't always like this. You know, there was for a long time working in tiny, really tiny, tiny rooms with no light, with uh, just with no natural daylight or anything like that. So it's very special to be able to work in a place like this. And so this space that I'm filming this video in now, this is the space where I film the videos for the School of Sweet Georgia. This is the place where I do a lot of my weaving. There's two looms in here. There's spinning wheels in here. This is the place where I store all of the gear that is involved in spinning and weaving and dyeing. And it is where I store a lot of the stash and the yarn stash, the fabric stash, all of that kind of stuff. So I just want to take you guys on a quick little tour around the room and I'll show you a little bit more about what's in each of these spots. It's not perfectly organized, but it is what it is right now and it works. Okay, so you guys can see it's kind of, there's a mess of stuff here, but basically, basically this room is occupied mostly by three big things. The first thing being the big Louette spring loom that's on the left here. And so that loom is 110 centimeters wide. And that is what, that's like about 45 inches is approximately what it is. And so right now on the loom, there is some cotton dish cloths. This thing here is, these are swatches for our fall colors that are going to come out later on this year. Um, working on that. So that needs to be woven off. And then there's a couple of other things that I have to return to the studio over there. Um, the other main thing that is here is the big table where I am recording all of the videos. And so this is a table that I kind of cobbled together from a bit of Ikea stuff. So there are two of those two by two sort of shelves. Let's try not to trip on anything. So one of these shelves here that contains a bunch of yarn that I'm currently working on different projects for. Um, and then over here, the other side, those are all knitting magazines, spin-off magazines, old spin-off magazines. So this is the table where we're doing our recording. And that's the current notebook that I'm working on. This is my bullet journal that is almost done. You can see my bullet journal. That one is almost done and needs to be switched to the next one. So this is where I sit. And you can see here we're using this microphone is the Zoom H4n and that's the microphone that I use to record audio mostly and that gets recorded um, that gets recorded externally and then I put the audio and the video together uh, when I do the final edit of these videos and that is the tripod that normally holds the camera but I'm holding the camera right now and then back here I'm lit by two big lights even though there's actually quite a lot of natural daylight in this room because you can see there's a big huge massive window that i put a big um, diffusion cloth against so to help diffuse a lot of the, the natural daylight that's coming through there but i also have additional light so there's one ring light here and then there's another big giant soft box to get as much light as possible so that i can get as low of an iso as possible for the video and that hopefully helps the quality of the video so that it's not grainy or anything like that. I have this very small um, external monitor that I use for attaching the, the camera to because I'm using right now the Canon 5D Mark IV for the video and it doesn't have a flip out screen so I can't actually see anything <laughs> that I'm filming unless I have this external monitor. So that is the filming stuff coming around here can see here that is the other loom that we have at 
the attic and that is the shacked baby wolf in cherry it's beautiful so this one you can see the last thing that was on here this is the um, sock blank that i had unraveled and made into a warp and i had attached it to my dummy warp here so this is basically a plain cotton warp that i put on the loom and everything is threaded and everything like that and then i tie onto the front end of those cotton ends i tie the yarn that i'm going to be weaving with and so that is that one there. It's all been cut off. And all I need to do is tie on the next project, which is another sock blank warp. And that's right there. And this is my absolute favorite thing. This is, let me see if I can put it here. That is an end feed shuttle from Shacked. And so this is a beautiful thing. It just has a tensioning device in here already and then produces really, really beautiful edges. Of course, I mean, you as the weaver, you're the one who's controlling the tension for the most part and um, making nice edges, but this also helps and it's a nice thing to have. And then in this corner here, we have an electric bobbin winder that I purchased off of eBay, I don't know, like 10 years ago. And um, it was just custom made by somebody who's making things on eBay. And then you can see back here the frame rooms that are currently resting. And this is a tension box for the shacked baby wolf loom. And so basically this is if you were going to use um, use the loom in a way that you do sectional warping. So basically here on the back side of this loom, there are tiny little pegs you can see on this back beam and so you could use those and basically you wind on your warp just you know two inches wide at a time and then you move to the next section and then you wind on two inches and you keep doing that until you create your warp in this case i have the sectional beam on but i'm not actually using it like that at all i just i just ignore the pegs and just keep going now here is where the yarn stash is two different kinds of white fabric for quilting there's one that is prepared for dyeing and one that's not prepared for dyeing. So it's a slightly different color, white 97 versus white 98. They're different colors. And then back here we have stash that is related to teaching classes, stash from different workshops that I've done. That's the Kool-Aid class. There's also uh, all the samples from the book that I wrote are all in these boxes here. So there is the rest of the yarn stash and I have the rest of the yarn stash all organized by weight. So there's one for lace, there's one for very, very fine weaving yarn, one for sock yarn, actually two boxes for sock yarn, one for sport, one for worsted, and some chunky ones, some mohair ones, things like that. This is the yarn that I said in the last mm, episode or something that is a full sweater's worth of yarn that I'm going to hold together and make a hohi boxy sweater out of. That's that. And here's the spinning wheel. This is the Lendrum Saxony. This is my dream wheel. It is beautiful and I think it's, yeah, it is also cherry. I love it. I just have not had enough time to spend with it. Um, yeah maybe when I retire. So over here, these shelves were built in to the attic when we first moved in. And so I, I have the fabric stash here, but I'm actually quite nervous about it being here because I find that it is exposed to light and I don't want for any of these corners or edges of these fat quarters to fade because of the light. So I do need to find another place to put them, but I, I like seeing them. So I have boxes here for fiber prep, Fiber prep stuff includes carding stuff and hand combs. Weaving tools includes bobbins and uh, pegs for rigid heddles, those kinds of things. Uh, spindles, those are hand spindles, Russian spindles are in there. Knitting tools includes things like notions, it is stitch markers, little uh, darning needles for grafting, those kinds of things. That box down there is missing a label, but that's the spinning tools thing. So that includes things like orifice hooks, uh, spinning wheel oil, and then quilting tools, binding clips, things like sewing needles, safety pins for basting quilts and things like that, minis, layer cakes, and scraps of quilting fabric. So all of that stuff is being sorted. And then over here, those are quilts that are in progress. 
there's kind of a few of them. Down here is basically my entire spinning stash. I have one box that's all superwash fibers, one that is all non-superwash fibers, and one that was all sort of teaching fibers and things like that. So that is one side of the attic. Let's come to the other side of the attic. What's on here? So basically over here, this is the sewing machine that I bought a couple of years ago in order so that I could do more quilting. And then over here, these are, this is the little basket of yarns that I am currently working with or, you know, using for swatching and things like that. Those are two of the socks that I was knitting as samples for the School of Sweet Georgia class. We were talking about self-striping yarns. And so those are the samples that are from there. And down here, this is my hand spun stash. So all of this hand spun is pretty much my own. There are a few skeins in here that were spun by some other spinners when we were doing the craftsy class. These, these are from Spin Cycle. That was one of the things that I picked up at a TNA. Spin Cycle yarns, awesome. But the rest of it, this is all my hand spun. And so I did have some plans for trying to make use of more of this hand spun. I just kind of want to spin it all and get rid of it all so that I can spin new ones and not feel guilty about that. In here, these are, looks like that's undyed yarn. Hmm. Uh, in here, looks like there is a Fair Isle project that I started something like 15 years ago and have not finished. Hmm. And so down here, this is the winding station that is meant for cones of yarn. And so this I find actually the super stressful. This is a super stressful part of the craft room in that there are those metal pegs that stand up from this and they're meant to hold cones of yarn. But if you don't have cones of yarn, they're just metal pegs that are sticking up, which is fine if you're um, a grown up and you can sort of avoid that. But I'm always always paranoid that someone will fall down and then poke their eye out on that. So I always have cones on here. It stresses me out completely and I can't seem to pull the pegs out to get them out of there. Two warping boards and also a lazy cape. So they just live back there. And then here we have the rack of cotton yarns. These are used for sectional warping. They're used for warping in general. They're used just to hold lots of pretty colors to look at. You can see there is some flax and silk fine that has been wound with a bobbin winder onto a big storage bobbin. And I'm gonna eventually use that for something. And now back here, that's the corner you don't want to show anybody. But that is basically it. So now, yes, like I said, I know it's very, very luxurious to be able to have space to spread out and keep your stuff out and be able to make things in a space like this. I recognize that I'm very, very lucky. But I have some suggestions or some tips for what you could do to carve out your own space for your own making. It is so important to have space to be separate from all of the other distractions and other things that are going on in your life so that way you can give yourself a playground to do your creative work. And so here are my five tips. The first one is to carve out a space of your own. And this could be as small as a corner of a room. It could be as small as just having a bookshelf in, in your bedroom. It could be a closet that you say this is designated for craft only things just to be able to corral and collate all of your stuff together in one place to look at it, to be inspired by it, to be motivated and encouraged by that. To have all your stuff in one place is super efficient because then you're not, you know, running around the house looking for that shuttle that went missing or, you know, the bobbin winder that you need or where do those extra bobbins go to? Like everything in one place is the best way to go. The second tip is to organize it like you would for a kitchen, you know, like, like things with like and have things 
organized by function. So even in this room, what I try to do is I try to corral all of the sewing things into one corner and then all of the knitting things into another corner. All of the weaving things and all the weaving tools are in another corner and all the spinning tools are in another corner. So that way I know where to go when I'm looking for things. And I also label everything, labeling all the boxes if possible so that I know where everything has gone to. The third thing is to clean it and keep it tidy. So this is hopefully very timely because it's springtime, it's spring cleaning time. This is a great time to like use all this beautiful natural daylight, pull out all your yarn stash, pull out all your boxes, empty everything off of the shelves and then refold or resort or, you know, just go through through everything and make sure everything is neat tidy and clean before you put it back because it could you know potentially sit there for you know many many months before you're able to go and actually use some of those materials so you want to make sure that all the storage is safe and clean the fourth thing is to protect your space so what I mean by that is this is your space that you need to sort of partition off or wall off and say, you know, it cannot be contaminated with toys and bits of Lego on the floor that you might step on. It can be a little bit of a job to keep those things from messing up your space. <laughs> So yes, in an ideal world, you would be able to keep all of your stuff nice and protected and clean and tidy in your own space and not have other people drop their random belongings in your craft space and leave them there. <laughs> and the fifth tip that I have is just to use your space. Come here, come to your creative space and use the tools and the materials and the yarn that's in the space. Don't just hoard it and let it sit for like months and years. I mean, this is advice to myself as well, right? Like you need to use your stash. You need to go through it. You need to be inspired by it. You need to make things out of it. So that's what I encourage you to do. Come to the space, even just to sit here for 15 minutes and look around and enjoy it. Yeah, just spend time in the room. Use your stuff. Don't just let it sit here because then it's just a storage room. It's not meant to be a storage room. It's meant to be a space for making things. So I think that's it for this week. Thank you guys so much for being here. If you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you would like to see more content like this, please hit the subscribe button and you will be notified every Friday when new videos go up. Now this week, I would love to hear about your craft space, what you use for your craft room, your own personal place where you put your knitting stuff or your yarn or your yarn stash. I would love to see pictures. If you can send me pictures, I would love to see and hear about where you guys make your things. So I guess that it is it for this week. Thank you guys so much for being here and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye for now.